I'm lost in the pines Where the sun never shines Shiver when the cold wind blows I shiver when the cold wind blows Darling, in the pines where the sun never shines my sweetheart got killed last Friday night About a mile and a half from town About a mile and a half When the train left the track And his body has never been found My Uncle Sam, he got a train from Baltimore to Maine She blows 900 miles and She mourns as she blows So lonesome and cold In the pines where the sun never shines Sounding great. Hi, it's uh, Sam from Guitar Village here, and today I'm joined by the fabulous guitarist, Mr. Martin Simpson. Hello. <laughs> You've been in the shop quite a few times now, and we've, we've, uh, we've seen some of you playing it. I mean, for those of you who aren't aware of what Martin does, he is an absolutely incredible player. You know, probably one of the finest acoustic guitar players out there. And on top of that, as you just heard, he sings as well. Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've been actually, it's funny, I'm just going through this period at the moment where everything just feels better than it ever has, you know, in terms of my playing, my singing, the people coming to the gigs, everything is just feeling really good. So I'm very, I get very excited about doing what I do. It's just a good, a good place to be. Absolutely. Do you, do you find you're playing more at the moment as a result of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Would you say in turn that if you, you know, you're playing more, practicing more, singing more, that it kind of takes care of itself? Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And the thing is, because of because of my very long time in this kind of music, you know, I'll be sitting around and I'll suddenly go, oh, oh, well, there's a tune. I haven't <laughs> thought about that tune. And it's a tune that I've probably known since I was a, a little kid, literally. And you, you go, whoa, I could do something with that. And so that's really exciting. It's constantly happening. There's a little Scottish tune I was playing the other day. And I just ended up going to some really really, you know, harmonizations which made me so happy. I spend hours doing that, you know. Yeah, it sounds lovely. And <laughs> can you tell me some of the, the tuning you're using here? Well, this one, this is C, G, C, F, C, D. And the way I think about tunings, they're all kind of traditionally based and they all have that root fifth root. You see a, a rock and roll <laughs> power chord, obviously. And then they usually have one other interval. So like a, a regular major tuning would have major third in it. This doesn't, it has a fourth, so it's suspended fourth, then there's another root, and then on the top is an added ninth. So this is C sus four add nine, basically. So it's a pretty complex sounding chord anyway, and then... It, yeah, but actually the thing, I, I had a complete, you know, revelation with this years ago, staying with a friend in Florida, 
and sitting there and thinking how hilarious it was to be so far away from standard tuning, but it's not actually, because if you look at it, that's like drop D, except the second string is tuned up to the tonic instead of being, you know, the, the sixth note of the scale, it's actually up there. And then the top string is, a, well, an add nine or a suspended second. So that is like playing D in drop D. It's very similar, and so, which means that all these triads and partials, they're all there from standard tuning. So you think you lost, and you're not. <laughs> yes, so you, you can always... Do you find it aids songwriting having open tunings, you know, to take yourself away from where you're comfortable? Um, well, I am comfortable in open tunings, <laughs> but I think, I think the thing that I like about them is... Um, I always say to people, you know, why would you want to play the F chord? It's, it's very clear to me why it's called the F chord. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I don't like it. I mean, that's what happens when you play bar chords. Obviously, there's place for that, but that's not what I want. You know, I want this to be... to be working for me. I want this, the guitar to be supporting what I do. And I use two fingers a lot of the time on my left hand. So this gives you more freedom then? It gives me more freedom. It, it, arguably, what I'm trying to do is make it easier to play the guitar. Not because I'm lazy, but because I want to be more musical about it. I want to be able to express. Yeah, you don't want to think, like you feel like you're going down the gym every time you pick this guitar up. No, I don't at all. I mean, I always say to people, if there's one thing I can teach you, always put your fingers as close behind the, the fret as possible. Because that way you don't have to put any pressure on. You're going to get better tone. You're, going, you're not losing any energy when you're doing hammer-ons and stuff. You're not, you're not bending the note out of tune because you're having to press it so hard. It's really hard, it's really easy on your fingers and it's really brilliant for your tone, so. Yeah, actually, speaking of fingers, can we look at your right hand for a sec? So You can look at my right hand. <laughs> so you, you've got, you generally you're a, a thumb pick and then fingers guy. It's three fingers which have all got silk wraps on them. Okay. Because if I didn't, then there wouldn't be any nails left. <laughs> and and uh, one of these Fred Kelly speed picks, which is just a great little thing. And yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, when I first started to play the guitar, I was in folk clubs, there were no PA systems. If you wanted to be heard, you had to strap on metal finger picks, you know. Oh, wow. So I learned to play, to start with, using a thumb pick and metal finger picks. Um, and I played bluegrass banjo for a little while. And, and so it gave me this hand position that I still have now, which is basically thumb out and, you know, fingers down there. And, and it, it's... It's very good. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's lovely and clear. You've still got the depth there, though, with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Still, especially with this guitar, which we're going to talk about in a minute, actually. Yeah. Um, when did you start playing guitar? I was 12. 12, OK. playing the guitar, yeah. And was it something that you, you, you wanted to do, or was it kind of just pushed upon you? No, not at all. No, I, I, I begged for a guitar for about four years before I got one, because it was, you know, it was the early 60s, and... Uh, my, my parents thought maybe I wanted to be the Beatles or something like that, <laughs> which I didn't want to be the Beatles. You know, at that point, I was a total musical snob. You know, I'd rather have been Robert Johnson or Muddy <laughs> Waters than the Beatles. I didn't really think the Beatles were very good until a little bit later. Um, they're, they're, they're doing all right. <laughs> they did all right, didn't they? Um, but no, I heard people like Paul Robeson um, and Harry Belafonte and then country singers and folk singers and I... And it just made me want to sing, and that's what that's what I you know I had to have an instrument to accompany myself, and I had a I had a Kingston Trio record when I was a little kid, and I used to hold it and look at these three guys who were sitting on stools like this, and one of them had a Martin D28, and the other had a little Martin 018T or something, which I I just thought nah nobody would <laughs> want to play that you know. Um, which it proves to be not the case nowadays. A lot of people do play tenor guitars. Yes. 
but also they had a Vega long neck banjo and I they sit and go which is the coolest of these instruments and eventually I thought well it's got actually I think it's the guitar really just the straight guitar and and I eventually got a guitar and that was it I was straight down the local folk club <laughs> Absolutely shockingly awful, you know, voice breaking, couldn't play. <laughs> so you went straight into singing and playing yeah, at the same yeah, time? Yeah, absolutely. And I loved it. And because I wanted to sing songs, because I think it's magic. Absolutely. With it in the right hands anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you hope. <laughs> Just let me sing your song, cause, cause. <laughs> no, please do. When I saw the ambulance screaming down Main Street, I didn't give it the thought. It was my uncle Eugene. He died on October the second, nineteen eighty-one. And my uncle Will, they all called him Skin. To say that for his younger way He'd get drunk every morning Show me the rolls of fifties and hundreds That he kept in the glove box And his old grey and the parlour And they're all gonna be here forever Mama, don't you make such a stir Put down that camera Come on in and join up the last Of the family my second cousin, his name was Calloway He died when he barely turned two And it was peanut butter and jelly that did it The hell she didn't know what to do She just stood there and she watched him turn blue And we're all gonna be here forever Mama, don't you make such a stir Put down that camera, come on and join up the last of the family reserve. My friend Brian Temple, he thought he could make it. So from the third story he jumped, and he missed the swimming pool only by inches. And everyone said he was. Julius and old Auntie Ma, Mary and Granddaddy Paul. There was Hannah and Emma and Alvin and Alec, and he owned his own funeral hall. And there's more I remember and more I can mention than words I could write in a song. But I feel them listening. I hear them singing along We're all gonna be forever Mama, don't you make such a stir Put down that camera Come on and join up the last of the family reserve Yeah, we're all gonna be here forever Mama, don't you make such a stir Put down that camera, come on in, join up the last of the family. Sounds great. It's a Lyle, Lyle Lovett song. Sounds brilliant. It's a, it's a lovely story in there as well, yeah, It's I guess. great. When I, rec I recorded that on a record called Home Recordings, and the record came out and people on social media were going, well, that's, that song, is it, is it true? I mean, you know, all the, the fantastic, those characters. And uh, I didn't know the answer to that. And then Lyle Lovett jumped in and said, everything in that song is exactly as it's described. All the people were real, you know, they're all lost. And, and he said, there's one inaccuracy. And that's in the first verse, it says, my uncle Eugene, 
He died on October the 2nd, 1981. He said he actually didn't. He died on October the 2nd, 1980, but that didn't scan. <laughs> I love that. Sometimes yeah. you have to adapt things slightly. You maybe, do, yeah. Just to make them work. To make them poetic, yeah. That's, uh, that's incredible. It sounds great on this guitar. Can you tell us a bit about this? This guitar um, is the result of a lot of time. <laughs> this was made by a friend of mine called Rory Dowling, who has a company in Fife in Scotland called Taron. And uh, he's very influenced early on by Stefan Sobel, whose guitars I've been playing you know, since 1980 sort of thing. And um, Rory basically has just pushed the envelope and kept on pushing the envelope in terms of the way he puts guitars together. And this guitar is made of African blackwood, which is an incredibly dense timber. I mean, this is not a lightweight guitar at all. This is a real piano of an instrument. Um, his attention to detail is mental. So you've got, you've got this sound port here, this chamfer here, which is for comfort, you know. Yeah. Um, and he, he called me up when he was building. He said, what's your favorite color? I said, why? <laughs> and he said, well, I, I want to do some stuff. And the, he, the walls of this guitar are about a quarter of an inch thick. The outside's blackwood, the inside's maple. And, and I told him, I, I, I really like Kingfisher Blue, you know. So, so the inside walls of this guitar are Kingfisher Blue, which you can see through there. And then all the purfling, uh, like this, is all the same colour wow. that he picked up. And I asked him about this burl that he used for the the cap on the headstock and the back of the headstock and the armrest and stuff. I said, where did you get that burl? It's outrageous. <laughs> he said, uh, I bought it from the Bentley Car Company. Oh, wow. <laughs> because they use it, you know, for their dashboards and their door panels and stuff. But it's got to be a certain size and they bought some burl that's too small, so. Ah, okay. Well, that worked out perfectly, didn't it? Works for me, yeah. And this is a fan fret model as well, It's a it? fan fret, but it's a very subtle fan fret. It's also 12 frets to the body. Uh, with this really deep cutaway, and it, it's just amazing. It's just a brilliant guitar. Yeah. And I'm using combination pickups in it. Rory doesn't like putting Highlanders in, and the Highlanders aren't made anymore, but there's a coaxial undersaddle transducer, and I've been using them for probably 30 years, and that's part of <laughs> my sound, you know. And he said, look, I'm gonna put a K&K &K Trinity in. I think it's great, and I got it, and it is great, but it doesn't have the bite that I require when I play. Um, and so I put a Highlander in. So it's got a K&K &K Trinity, um, which comes out there, which is three, um, three different transducers and a microphone, and then the Highlander in there. And so it's, it's pretty much covering everything you need. I was going to say, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a great, great range of tones, I guess. It is, it is. Great it, coverage of those tones anyway. It just a, sounds like a, an enormous guitar. How do you find, if you go further up the neck with the capo, does it, does it thin out like some acoustics do? Not at all. No, not, not in the slightest. It's actually, it just becomes another instrument. You play it up here. No, I mean, this, is, this guitar doesn't have any of... Uh, problems at all in terms of that sounds great it does kill Another instrument, isn't it? Really, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. I love, I love the look of it. I think the detailing on it's really nice. It's a bit like a Ted Baker suit, isn't it? It's pretty serious on the outside, with a few little flourishes, and then oh, on the inside, you know, they, yeah, they kitted <laughs> it out. They're, they're more playful on the inside. Yeah, yeah, it's which amazing. I really like. Yeah. It's, um, and you brought another guitar with you I today. I did. I did. Yeah, let me. Uh, you pop that one oh, over oh, there. I'll take good care of this one for a sec. <laughs> This was made by my friend Rosie Haydenrich, who is in Surrey. And Rosie's, uh, she's in her 30s, I guess. And she is an amazing builder also. So this, this is mahogany, reclaimed mahogany, and it's beautiful, but she uses a lot of English wood. So this is sycamore. Um, 
this is European moon spruce. Uh, ebony because I just like ebony better than anything else for bridges and fingerboards. And uh, yeah, again, her attention to detail, if you look inside this guitar, it's so beautifully constructed. It's a little bit less avant-garde than that one, but not a lot, when, the more you look at it. You know. uh, there's so many details I'm picking up on with this guitar, just subtle things, yeah. just, you know, especially the headstock. I mean, well, it's, is... it's turnstone guitars, you see, like after the little bird that... Uh, I turned up at a gig in Shoreham by Sea the other day, and the, the Arts Centre's right next to the river, and the tide was ripping out, you know, and I always, I mean, I do a lot of, I do a lot of bird watching when I'm on the road, you know, and I just went and walked and looked over this, the bank of this, uh, the river, and, and there were 11 turnstones feeding in the mud as the tide rushed by them, you know, so that's, yeah, that's her little logo there. Very, very nice. Yeah, this is a very, very cool guitar. It's, um, it is. And do you find yourself you lean more towards luthier built guitars? <laughs> well, I've got. It's an interesting question that I've, I have been um, commissioning guitars since I was twenty-one. I, yeah. When I was a kid, you know, I mean, the first, the first acoustic guitar I got. It's worth kind of looking at this. I think was a Harmony Sovereign, and that would be like oh, 1968, yes. you know, a, a new Harmony Sovereign. It was enormous, actually. They're really big guitars. Yes, know? I played a few. Yeah, and, and they're good guitars. They're properly made guitars, ladder-braced, obviously, but really kind of cool. So I had that for a bit, and then I, I traded that in, and I got a, a tiny little Guild, an F20 Guild. Yeah. And then I traded that in, and I got a Gibson J45, and then I went, you know what, these are all good, but I, I think... I think I need a step up somehow. So I went down to Ivor Morant's shop in London. Yes. And I took my J45 with me and I traded it in against a Martin 0018, which was, you know, that was the best guitar I'd ever played at that point. And it got stolen very, very <laughs> shortly thereafter. And I, you know, I'd, I'd uh, gone abroad to do a, a, some work in Algeria, of all places, and on the way back, it got nicked. The only thing that didn't okay. get nicked, my clothes were nicked, the guitar was nicked, the banjo, they didn't want the banjo, so I got the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, it's cruel. And uh, I got an Epiphone Texan, which was a nice guitar, but it was tiny little neck, you know, and it, didn't, it just didn't have what I wanted. So I commissioned my first guitar from a guy called Peter Abnett in Kent. And since then, that's basically what I play is guitars that people have made for me because... They put, they put so much into it, you know. I mean, I do, I have one vintage Martin, which is an absolute monster guitar. But you can't, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm debating whether I can actually put pickups in it and take it on the road, you know. It's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it, with vintage guitars? You, you have that sort of almost responsibility to these old instruments. Yeah. I had a 1931 0012 fret, 0018 12 fret, which was absolutely incredible. And I had it for about five years, and I wrote a lot on it, and I recorded it, I mean, it recorded so well. But I literally <clears throat> couldn't take it out of the house, really, except to record. You couldn't, you couldn't put it, it was so light and dry, you know. And you yeah. didn't want to put a pickup in it, you screwed it up. So eventually I just, I thought, right, you know what, we've had a great time. There's no marks on it except the tiny little dings that I put between the strings because of the way that I play. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put this out in the world again, you know. And it lives in Luxembourg now, I think, that guitar, so. But no, I, I moved to live in the States and there was a thing, you know, when I was a kid growing up, there were hardly any builders in this country at all. Going to the States was like, oh, there's yeah. so many great guitar builders over there. And it was at that point where it was really burgeoning. So I went to this thing called the Association of Stringed Instrument Artisans. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, all the best builders were there. I mean, literally all the best builders. You couldn't, it just was ridiculous. You know, and so, and I, I would pick up their guitars and play them and they all went, you know what, he's really useful because he makes them sound good. <laughs> so I got kind of adopted, you know. If you, at, at one point, if you called the Martin Guitar Company, the hold music was me playing a Sobel guitar. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> which made me so happy because, you know, the guy, the guy in charge of artist relations, Dick Boak, was an enormous 
friend, supporter, and fan, you know. Yeah. And so he just like he'd sneak my stuff into <laughs> to situations like that. So yeah, basically, you know, I've always just loved that thing of having a relationship. I mean, you know. That guitar, that oh, guitar, this one, sorry. yeah. So I'll give this back to you. I yeah, think. Th this one is a result of years and years and years and years of back and forth, and you know, design ideas, and so it's you know, it's just amazing kind of. It's an amazing process. Yeah, I was going to talk to you a bit about the process when when it comes to to you know creating a guitar like this. So, you know, luthiers have woods available, don't they? And they show you what they've got on offer. And you kind of, you have to work with them because you have an idea in your head of what the guitar's gonna look like and they have an idea of how it's yeah. gonna look as well. Yeah. I, I, um, the older I get, the more I want to just let people have their head when it comes to, to what they do because, yeah, you know, I think when, when you, young and massively enthusiastic you're well I want it to be like this and this and this and I want this do this and and then you know sometimes very obviously a guitar maker is going to know a lot more than you do <laughs> <laughs> about making guitars and uh, so you can give them too much information and end up kind of I appreciate that we do a similar thing um, with, with the Fender custom shop believe it yeah. or not you know when yeah. people have a custom quote in mind they give you all these options yeah and we've been doing it for years and years, and we like to, you know, try and help people out as much as possible because we know what things will work together. Yeah. And it's good to keep fairly standard and just add a little bit of a you know, spice on top, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, having said that, I mean, this is radically different to yeah. to the first guitar that that Rory made for me, you know. And it was just, I actually a, one of my students at a workshop had 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 a guitar almost identical to this made. Yeah, and uh, and I I was using an earlier model and it, and I said, can I just have a go on that, please? And it had the fan frets and this, and I just <laughs> called Rory up and said, you bastard, <laughs> have to have one, you know. Do you find um, when you get a new guitar, that's it? You're stuck, you know. You you want to pick that thing up every day. Yeah, you for a should while. do. I think. Yeah, that's. Uh... Well, this this guitar. Because the pickups in it are so great, this is the only guitar I've used on stage since I've had it, basically. And I have a lot of different guitars, and I love them. I really love them. And I don't like it when I don't use them, you know. Yeah. So this one is uh, this one is is actually going to, to visit Rosie tomorrow, and it's going back to have a little tweaking done on the pickups because the, the Highland is a little bit out of balance. So. Oh, okay. But she'll fix it. And she'll fix it and get it back on the road. Well, at least you're in the right area for I that am anyway. Indeed, yeah. It's um, a couple of other things I, I kind of wanted to talk to you about, um, which does, it's more to do with your, your teaching. So you do some, some online workshops as well, don't I you? I do, yeah. You like to pass as much information on as possible. I love it. When, you know, when I decided I wanted to be a professional musician, which was basically the moment I touched a guitar, I was like, right, this is what I'm going to do. And I was, you know, 12 then. By the time I was 17, I was doing some gigs and, and I, I just wanted to make money playing the guitar, you know. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about, you know, I don't wanna, I want to make lots of money and be a star. It was about legitimising what I was doing because, it, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. My parents didn't have a lot of money. So I just I went, right, I am going to demonstrate that I can be a professional musician and earn a living with this instrument, earn a living doing what I love because what better is there, you know? And so I started to teach and the moment I started to teach, I had this massive revelation, which is that in order to teach somebody what you do, you have to understand what you do. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and I was going, wow, that's brilliant because not only do they get something out of it, but I get about three times as much out of it <laughs> because I'm understanding. Yeah. In order to describe what it is, I've got to comprehend it, you know. So, I mean, I use a lot of different tunings. And when I lived in the States, um, you know, there were a lot of tunings in use, but people, ha people had no idea of how to relate one to the other. And I just, you know, I sat down and went, Phew. Right, come on, there's got to be a system we can, we can properly communicate about this. And so I, I figured that out and, you know, did a couple of uh, 
a couple of series of, of videos about it all, and it, and it's it's a big thing, yeah. you know. Well, you, you, you're very helpful, actually, on your website. You have to offer lots of tablature as well, don't you? Oh, for, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, which is really which, funny because I have never in my life learned anything from tablature. Never. Never, once. ever. <laughs> but I do. I, I, I write it down, you know, technically. I do the, the, the actual transcription of what I'm doing. And I send it to this friend of mine in New York called John Roberts, who's actually from Kidderminster. He's an English <laughs> guy, and he's got ears like a bat. Oh. <laughs> and so he, you know, he, he gets my transcriptions, and I'll do a little film for him as well, and he'll get back in touch. He goes, I, I think you're finding measure 16. You're, you're saying you're playing this, the note there, but actually I think it's the open string there. That, and I'm going, yeah, you're right. He's always right. That's, that's <laughs> a great... Well, uh, you know, a, a lot of guys now will learn things from Tab, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the thing is, a lot of it, is, you know, if you go to, like, Ultimate Guitar, somewhere like that, you know, it's people who... You don't know who's put that tab up. They they put this thing together and they've just sent it out there. Yeah. And there's you know thousands of people that will look at that and go, oh, I'll learn the song from that. Could be wrong. And there's Could no be. one double checking it. Yeah. Well, I I did send a transcription that somebody had sent to me of one of my things to John and said, can you look at this? And he went, this is this is gobbledygook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do it again. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, I think that's so helpful and. You know, and you, you have your own YouTube channel as well. You I do, you do uh, you know, performances of songs, you know, it helps. Yeah, and I've got a, a Patreon page too, which is fun, a Patreon site, I should say, you know, where people can send me a tenner a month and they, they, can, they can get things like me, you know, doing work in progress on, on arrangements and talking about the instruments and, you know, all that kind of yeah. fun stuff, like behind the scenes stuff on gigs and... It's so, so, we're so lucky really to have this now, you know, when, when you looked at musicians, you know, it, when, even when you look at the 80s and 90s, you really only get snippets, you know, you might get some of the recording process, but it's really like doctored and things like that, isn't it? Whereas, yeah. you know, and, and if you wanted to watch some, a guitarist play something up close, live, it's just unheard of. Whereas now you can, literally, you can almost like text someone. You yeah, know, you can. You know, what are you doing there? And then yeah. you'll get a response. Yeah, well, we all have mobile phones, you know, you can, yeah. can do that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when I was a kid, for instance, in the town that I grew up, I grew up in, there were nobody played the five-string banjo, you know, and I wanted to play the five-string banjo. <laughs> and I had one lesson, basically, from Peggy Seeger and Ewan McCall came to town and played at the folk club. And I asked Peggy Seeger to show me how to frail the banjo, which is all down picking, claw hammer banjo, it's called. And so she showed me how to do it, and I sat there and went like that. And she took a biro and she wrote slowly across there. And that was it. That was my banjo lesson, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, but stuff like that, you know, there was, I couldn't find any film of people playing. I couldn't. Nowadays, you go to YouTube and put somebody's name into YouTube. I found a guy on YouTube who had first recorded in 1928. One of my absolute heroes, a banjo player called Buell Kazee. That's a great it, name. It is, isn't it? It's from Kentucky. And he's an utterly brilliant bloke, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just, I was looking for a song of his and I thought, well, I'll go on YouTube, you'd just be a recording. This him sitting there playing the banjo in the 1960s, beautifully filmed, yeah. describing exactly what he was doing. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> it's mind God. blowing, isn't it? Wish I'd seen that when I was 14, <laughs> you know. Wow, absolutely. Well, I think, yeah, like I said, we're, we're so lucky to have these things like our fingertips, you know, it's not like we have to go anywhere. You can sit at home, you can, you can spend eight hours in a yeah. day yeah. learning bits of other players. And I think it's really important, that visual thing, as you know, I mean, I, I always talk to people about the fact that really, you know, when you're learning to play in open tunings, you shouldn't use a tuner as much as possible. You shouldn't use a tuner because your eyes will always override your ears. And if you're going like this and staring at something to see if you're in tune, you're not actually using your ears. But every so often to watch a film of somebody playing, yeah. You know, I remember watching a film of Mississippi Fred McDowell, who's like really funky slide player, really kind of mantraic slide player. But he would he would stop and he'd vamp this really weird little, <laughs> literally like, <laughs> like that 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 much 
playing. And he, and he was playing in open D major, and I'm going, what happened? What is it? What is it? He's not playing open D major. What is he playing? And it wasn't until I saw a film of him a little bit later on that I realised he was when he did that vamp, he would just put the, his finger down on the second fret of the second string and <laughs> play a major six chord. And so like, I would never, ever have thought to even try playing a major six chord as a vamp in a really primitive delta blues. Why would you do that? <laughs> Because it's brilliant. You know, yeah, and it obviously works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was one of those things where I went, if I hadn't seen that film, I'd still be going, huh? <laughs> one of those great mysteries. Yeah. What? Oh, Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on our show. And um, uh, was there anything you'd like to play for us? Yeah, before you yeah go? I'll tell you what I'll do. Hand me that guitar again, and I'll just, I'll just show you this thing because this is kind of, I'm just really loving this at the moment. <laughs> but it makes me so happy. That sounds lovely from here. I hope, I hope the mics are picking that up as well. Well, I should think so. <laughs>